Thank you so much for tuning into Creative Habits Podcast. Um, today we have a very, very special guest. Her name is Carmen Pittman, and she's a visual artist. And um, we are so happy to have you. Welcome to the show. Hi, thank you for having me. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about yourself. Where are you from and what do you do? Um, I was born in D.C., uh, but I've been raised mostly in Maryland, all, all over Maryland. Um, I am, well, I call myself a teaching artist now. I discovered mm. that term like this year and I was like, cool, it's mine. <laughs> so I am an artist, but I also really enjoy teaching art um, and letting people express their creativity. So, yeah. How would you describe your artistic style? Um, it's funny, if you had asked me that a year ago, I would have had absolutely no clue how to answer that. Um, I've kind of discovered it through quarantine. So um, I would say really colorful and abstract. <laughs> it's gotten more and more abstract. Um, I enjoy a lot of patterns. I enjoy um, different, I incorporate different aspects from like nature and obviously black people. Mm. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit more about um, your interest in uh, becoming a teaching artist. How did that come about or when did you decide that that was the journey that you wanted to take? Um, it's funny, both of those journeys were independent and kind of like met in the middle recently. Uh, when I got out of college, I didn't want to be an artist and I didn't want to be a teacher. Um, and so I was really kind of like meditating and praying on like what I should do and what I felt like my purpose in life was. And I realized like I had kind of been doing both of those things for a long time. Um, I've been a camp counselor since I was 15. I'm the oldest of my th other three siblings. And so you naturally are a leader and a teacher in that <laughs> space. Um, so I realized that I actually really do enjoy teaching because I'm always telling people stuff that they did not ask. <laughs> and um, since a very young age, I really enjoyed art, but I didn't have the confidence to call myself an artist mm -hmm. um, because I felt like that was some, oh, that's, you know, for people who know what they're doing, you know, <laughs> I thought everybody else knew what they were doing <laughs> and not me. So that all came to a head kind of during, um, quarantine where I was like no I want to fully be an artist and fully be a teacher and creating my own business allows me to do both. So where did you go to school and what did you study because you said that you finished school but you didn't want to become an artist or an educator so what did you study? Um, I double majored in Spanish and studio arts at the University of Pittsburgh. Um, I went there thinking I would major in biology. <laughs> that did not happen. Um, I didn't realize how much math <laughs> was necessary for biology. Um, and But I knew when I went in, I would minor in art. And I started looking at the art classes and the biology classes. And I was like, yeah, I don't want to. <laughs> I want to take biology anyway. So I started majoring in art. And I've been learning Spanish since I was five. Oh, wow. And it was a skill that I thought that I should try to keep and um, nurture. And so I was like, I'll minor in Spanish. Then I found out the minor was only five classes away from the major. So I was like, all right, we're double majoring. <laughs> so <laughs> it's funny how they kind of happen by happenstance, uh, but it, it's what needed to, to happen. So, yeah. Wow, that's quite amazing. And I feel like with both a degree in art and Spanish, um, there's so many opportunities for you as an artist, not just mm -hmm. in America, but globally. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> I hope so. Um, so the painting behind you is quite fascinating. Um, I wanted to ask a few questions about your artistic practice and mm -hmm. just in terms of your exploration as an artist how did you come to deciding that you wanted to focus on abstract art 
or just the style um, of abstract? Well, I had to unlearn some things first. I had learned or somehow came up with the idea that realism and representational art is like real art or just a higher caliber or just, you know, false things that are not true. But, and so I didn't value those things even though I really enjoyed them. And so I had to unlearn the, the wrongness <laughs> of that concept and then fully embrace the things that I actually liked and give myself permission to um, enjoy them and like them. And so a lot of my art process has really just been giving myself permission to just do the things that I want to do regardless of what the perceived value is um, by society or myself. <laughs> Um, so yeah, I started getting into abstract art. Um, I really enjoy bright colors and a lot of it started from improving my own mood. So uh, during, you know, Corona, we've been stuck inside. We're not supposed to go anywhere, you know, and I took on the project to like um, beautify my room and make it like a really nice space for myself. And I ended up making 11 or 10, 10 of these large, these are bed sheets. I ordered bulk bed sheets and just started painting on them. I added fabric mix to my acrylic paint and just like went for it. So <laughs> that's what I did like half of quarantine was, yeah, fix my room up. <laughs> I love that. And that's so resourceful because oftentimes I'm just like, I don't know like how to get a huge, you know, piece in my house or even the mm -hmm. expenses of buying something on such a greater scale, but bed sheets, like I would have never thought of that in such, such a good idea. It, it came out of necessity because I was like, yeah, curtains. And then I saw how much curtains were and I was like, no, that's no. not happening. <laughs> Bed sheets look like curtains though, so oh. and they're lighter. So mm -hmm. I will use them. So that that's how that came about. Yeah. So when did you start teaching? And what was that first experience like for you? Hmm. Um it's funny, I don't really know. Like I said, I started being a camp counselor when I was 15. Uh, obviously, you know, you're not in charge of the kids at that age, but it just was a very gradual thing. Um, I was always really shy. And so I was never like, hey, put me in front. I'm the teacher. Like, I was just happy, very happy and content being the assistant. Um, I think when I got over 21, I started being in charge of the classrooms of the programs or, you know, what was being taught. So I just kind of like naturally went into that role. Um, but the first time I started teaching during the school year was at an African-centered school and um, where I was teaching all ages. Uh, and so that that was probably my first like, okay, no, I'm for real a teacher. <laughs> so that was a really, um, that was a really good experience. It taught me a lot and it actually gave me a lot of versatility and so I, I really, really enjoyed that experience. So what were your thoughts in terms of developing a curriculum for the students? Because I know teaching at an African-centered school is very unique, um, just in mm -hmm. terms of how the structure of the teaching philosophy is, um, or just mm -hmm. the overall mission. So I just wanted to know how you approach your teaching um, ideas or like teaching process for lesson planning. Um, to cater to those type of students? Um, well, I definitely got a lot of help, but uh, I usually started with my art classes. I started from a black artist. So I would use them to teach a concept or a style. Um, for example, if we're trying to learn like color theory and the relationships between colors, then I'll pick an artist who does a lot of pattern work or brightly or uses a lot of um, color and use that to introduce them to those concepts. Um, so yeah, usually through a black artist or um, different um, black, I, I guess the word is like art, 
practices or um, skills. Mm -hmm. that we know originated from Black people. And so whether I could find a particular person or if I had to use several people, um, I, that's where I would kind of start most of my lessons. Since you've had that experience of um, being a teacher in a school setting, now that you're moving towards your own business, um, you know, becoming an artist and a teacher, an art educator, what does that look like for you? And how do you feel like um, that will go in terms of what you envision for that business? Um, I think the direction I really want to go is just enabling children to, giving them the tools to express their creativity. Not really just children, um, adults as well, but I, you know, I focus on children. And so I, am right now starting summer programs where through Zoom for now and hopefully in person, <laughs> we'll see what happens. Um, but for now I'm starting summer programs where I'm gonna have art classes on Saturdays. And um, because I also know Spanish, I'll also be having Spanish immersion art classes. That's so fantastic. Having kids be able to practice Spanish, but also kind of distract them with the like, hey, we're having, we're doing art, we're having fun, but like, give me these colors in Spanish. <laughs> so um, just trying to use all my skills and also, you know, impart really the knowledge that I have to other people, because that's what teaching is. Yeah, definitely. That's fantastic. So I know that we kind of started backwards, but what is the name of your business? Oh, um, the name of my business is Color Me Awesome. Uh, it's color with a K because my name Carmen starts with a K. <laughs> so what will um, Color Me Awesome provide? Um, it will provide art education um, for children and eventually um, summer programs, after school programs, um, and again, just the space to let kids be creative. You know, I really enjoy the kind of extracurricular space because I don't want to be attached to, you know, grades or you must complete this or whatever. I really just want to give the kids freedom to use the materials safely and, you know, do what they want in a safe environment. So, yeah. It's definitely difficult to grade art. I like even in the setting of a classroom, I've never known what to do <laughs> when it comes to grading. So um, yeah, I think that's phenomenal. I love the fact that you're integrating arts with Spanish because um, I do feel like art is a catalyst, a catalyst for change. Art is a catalyst yeah. um, is a a space where you can think critically and learn how to move and process things a little bit differently from mm -hmm. you know other subjects using that creativity mm -hmm. in your your mind to imagine <laughs> the possibilities of something that you probably would have never thought of before um, so let's yeah. talk a little bit more about your own personal artistic practice I know the two are combined, but um, how would you describe yourself um, artistically? I know that we discussed mm. your style, but what um, do you envision for your own personal practice or is it combined still with the art education portion? Um, that has been a little difficult. I'm, I'm actually figuring that out now, how to juggle um, you know, my goals with teaching art and also still having, um, you know, my own practice. So um, right now, my own practice has actually been doing murals. I've been able to assist with two murals, well, assist with one and do another mural recently. Um, and so I guess my own practice right now is really is creating the time to have my own practice. <laughs> There's so many things that I want to do and I need to make the time to do them. Um, so like I said, that's something I'm kind of still in the process of figuring out how to juggle the two. <laughs> yeah, I, I can relate. I can definitely relate to that as an artist. And I think that's why the regular nine to five or like a 
job situation for an artist is very difficult um, because yeah. as an artist, you do so much, you know, there's so many things that you can be involved in. So I've also had the challenges of trying to figure out if I'm just going to, you know, practice my own personal <laughs> exploration as an artist or be an art educator. I don't know, but I always jump yeah. back and forth. So one season I'm just an artist and another season I'm an art educator. <laughs> so I can definitely relate right. to that. Figuring out those seasons is 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 the key, I mm -hmm. guess, and obviously it will change. And then throwing in like business owner into the mix, where you know, when you're self employed, like your job is everything. So everything that's got to get done is through you. Um, so then it's like, well, I've got to send these emails. <laughs> I don't know if I should do that or think. Um, so yeah, like I said, I, it's it's a process, but we'll figure it out. In terms of the business side of art, um, I do know that this season we want to really focus more on trying to provide information for other artists or beginner artists, up and coming artists or artists that don't really know the business side of art. How, how mm. do you navigate that? So I know that as a self-employed artist, you may require like um, to sign up for an LLC or, you know, kind of manage your own accounting. How have you approached that? And what are some things that you can probably share with us um, for someone that's getting started into becoming a full-time artist? Um, well, yes, I'm definitely getting started. So I've got um, mostly beginner tips for people. I, um, I recently got a SCORE mentor. So the, I think they work through the SBA or mm. I think they're separate, but SCORE allows you to get a free business mentor um, and they work with you for several months or maybe several years and give you advice and let you know, you know, if you can find, find somebody in your field, um, they'll let you know a lot of the things that are necessary. So I got a score mentor and so they've, they'll, they help me figure out when's the good time to become an LLC because that might not be necessary at first. Mm. Um, since I seek to do children's programming and things like that, when I start doing that in person, being an LLC will be important because I'll need, you know, to protect myself and separate myself from the business and have insurance and different things like that. So um, yeah, getting a score mentor has helped me a lot. And to be honest, I, the first, the very first thing I did when I decided I really wanted to start my own business was I got a therapist. Mm, yeah. <laughs> I decided that um, I wanted to have a healthy work-life balance and I wanted the tools to be able to do so. And so that for me is the foundation to everything else because if you create something and you can't sustain it then you know you're there's going to be fallout from that you know it might not all crash and burn but you'd rather just create something that is sustainable than to get to a place and you're you just kind of fall apart and so for me the first step to starting my own business was get, gaining the tools to manage my personal life my business life you know relationships so that I can do them all successfully, as successfully as I can. <laughs> and, um, you know, cause I, I was never good at juggling, you know, all three, one of them always went to the wayside and then I, I go to pick that one up and the other one falls. And so I, I didn't want to live my life like that. And so, yeah, getting a therapist helped tremendously mm -hmm. and, um, yeah, I would say those are those are my those are suggestions I have because that's how far I got. <laughs> Thank you. I mean, that's absolutely amazing, and I think that sometimes with the way the world works and just having to constantly do, <laughs> we don't often yeah. have a space to kind of quiet our minds and actually listen to our thoughts. So I think that's really amazing that you've um, also decided to go to therapy while you're building your brand and building your business, especially as a black woman in America. So <laughs> kudos to you. Yeah. <laughs> we be needing it sometimes. Just yes. the extra support and having somebody to talk to yes. um, can be really helpful. Mm. So now 
how has the virtual teaching been um, or virtual art classes? Because I, if I was in the educational setting at this moment, being an art mm -hmm. teacher, I think I would have lost mm -hmm. my mind. <laughs> Um, I almost did. Okay, mm -hmm. so <laughs> uh, there was a lot of that in the beginning, I'm sure for everybody. Art was difficult for me because it, at least when I'm teaching, it's a very, it's more physical. Like mm -hmm. if a child is like, oh, I can't do this, I can show them how to do it, you know, in person, um, depending on their age actually assist them with it. And so not being able to do that and being so hands off virtually, um, is really difficult. Uh, it limit, I, ha, I limit some of the um, projects that I do and, and tailor them so that it's easy for me and the students to be able to do together online. Um, well, maybe not limit, but just explore different options, right? You know, art is infinite. There's so many different things that you you can do and so you know maybe you can't do like origami or something like that but you know we can do paintings and watercolors and grow plants you know <laughs> with each other like so I think um maybe looking at it as exploring other options but at first I was definitely like oh my gosh all this stuff <laughs> I can't do now um because it just becomes it does become very difficult Yes, it can. So there were a few, there was a series that was extremely striking to me of that, you know, that you created. Um, and I just wanted to know, I forget the name of the series, but they were images of children with the back of their heads. What inspired uh. you to create that piece? And are you gonna do anything else with that? Um, well, yeah, so I called them the Afro Ladies and Afro Babies um, series. They were, I went natural in 2016. I studied abroad in Chile and I was, I had been perming my hair since I was uh, really young. And I was like, I, I want to keep my hair, so I'm not going to perm it in a different country. So I went natural from then on and I had to learn how to, I had to learn what my hair did, how it grew, what it was doing. Obviously I spent a lot of time on YouTube um, <laughs> during the whole kind of like natural boom. It just kind of coincided very easily. And I just got really inspired by all of the beautiful hairstyles and versatility that we had. And not just the versatility and what we could do with our hair, but also the versatility of the textures and colors and curl patterns, et cetera. Uh, one of the difficulties in the natural hair space is, okay, your hair does that, my hair doesn't do that. It might look the same, but they're not the same. Um, and so all of that was like really inspiring. And so um, as I was learning how to do my own hair, seeing other people's types of hair, I decided to kind of embody that in that in this series. And I did um, three adult women and uh, four children and just was kind of just celebrating our, you know, again, the versatility of really blackness and, and mm. Afro features, um, because, you know, we don't always get to see that in mainstream. And so, you know, they don't have to celebrate it, we will. <laughs> so that it was really just like, a, we're not worried about y'all. This is, this is what we're doing over here. So, yeah. What was Chile like? Am I saying it correctly? Is um, it Chile? It's Chile. Mm -hmm. I kind of like do a middle of like English Chile. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, it was really fun. Uh, there's not a lot of black people. So um, definitely a lot of staring. A lot of people thought I was Colombian. Uh, mm -hmm. So that was fun. I had a baby on a metro just like break his neck to look at my afro. So, you know, funny things like that. But I actually, um, it was really nice to um, learn from other people, experience a different culture. That's the first time I had been out of the U.S. Mm. like in my entire life. And um, just being able to immerse myself in a different culture for five months was um, really a, a blessing that um, I didn't even think would happen. Um, and so I got to do that right before I graduated. Um, and, and start learn and I was able to take some art classes too. Oh, wow. And so yeah, it was just, 
really interesting exploring all the different avenues of just kind of being not temporarily but like semi-permanently in another country so what do you think you envision um for color me awesome in about five years five years um i see color me awesome having its own building and running lots of different art programming for all ages out of that and then also enabling other businesses to use that space mm. for their creative programming um i also envision an art summer camp where you know art might be the central axis of it but just really again a safe place to explore creativity and connect with other children and also employ other artists um, because, you know, artists are the masters of the side gigs and the, and the side jobs and whatever. So eventually being to, able to help other people on their journey um, and being a service to the community, um, you know, also enabling, you know, running programs for free or reduced price or, you know, excuse me, for, for again, the community. And so that, that's pretty much what I see in five years. Nice. Yep. What do you, um, how do you find your clients? Um, right now I find them through social media and word of mouth. Um, I was vending a lot in 2017. So I built up an email list okay. um, of, you know, people who were just interested in what I was doing. And so being able to have that was really invaluable. Um, and then, yeah, email and social media marketing um, have been like my main go-tos being virtual. So I'll, I'll probably take more traditional routes when we get in person, like posters and, and, and more stuff like in person. But, um, but I've also been using my SCORE mentor for that because I mm. haven't really mastered the art of um, marketing yet so um that's what she's helping me with so we're going on that journey together <laughs> awesome what do you think the top five things artists need in order to succeed mm -hmm. not to be successful but to succeed mm, right because there's a difference <laughs> um i think well, at least for me, um, Corona really helped me be still and figure out what my goals were. So really taking the time to figure out what you feel like your purpose is, what are your goals? What are you trying to say to the world? Um, I definitely read several art books that like kind of helped me explore and ask those questions of myself. So really taking the time to soul search and it's really not a one-off like, okay, I figured it out. Like you have to really revisit it and go back and keep questioning it. Um, so soul searching is probably number one. Um, number two, I would say a therapist. Again, I'm biased, but I just think, you know, having the tools to navigate, you know, life healthily um, is really beneficial. Um, three, I think, um, hmm, I think you need uh, persistence and to do things uh, in a sustainable way. So you have to figure out what's sustainable for you and what you can do and don't let other people tell you that and mm -hmm. then you need the persistence to follow that and go along with it um what am I on three okay four wow this is hard <laughs> <laughs> um let's see persistence I said a therapist a four. website okay yes let's talk <laughs> practical you definitely need a website good social medias they should all like coincide. I guess part of the soul searching is because you can come up with your branding while you're doing that. You need mm. a story to tell other people um, to say, I do this for this because of this. And so um, doing the soul searching enables you to kind of create the language and the things necessary for branding. 
And so having the website, having a professional email that doesn't have Gmail at the end of it, <laughs> um, eventually, right? We're all, we're all getting there. Um, and the fifth thing is probably perseverance, <laughs> tenacity. Got you. Um, you know, you have to just like, you know, get the, the gumption, the energy to like, you know, complete all these things. And, and so I, I would say those are the five things I needed to build up and, and start reaching my goals as a business owner and an artist. Nice. So before we conclude this interview, um, mm -hmm. I wanted to know what you were reading because I want to read them too. <laughs> what, were, what were the art books that you were reading? Well, um, this one, I actually had a workshop in college and it's called um, Artwork. Oh, by... I have that in orange. <laughs> yeah. So there's a new one. I got oh, the nice. new one because I was like, oh, there's new stuff. I need to know. Yeah, I need so, to know too. Artwork was one of the main books by Heather Darcy Bahandari. I don't know how to say that. Anyway, she that the first chapter really helped me a lot with the soul searching and asking mm. the important questions like, why are you doing this? You know, because as an artist, we can get bogged down by, oh, they're doing that and they're doing that. So, you know, comparing yourself to other people. So that was one of the main um, books that I've been reading. Um, I also, on my list, to read is also um I think it's like how to steal artwork or um yes um I don't know the title of the book is like stealing how, yeah how to be well something like how, how to be an artist that steals or how I know right. exactly there's a black one and a yellow one <laughs> yes you know yeah. what I'm talking about that's the next how, on my no list. I got it how to steal like an artist Ex okay there we go right because nothing's new under yeah. the sun. So that's the next book on my list. Nice, nice. That's a great selection. But yes, I definitely need to get the yellow artworks book because I had the orange one, but that was what, eight years, 10 years ago? So yeah, it's been a minute. Yeah, so they <laughs> a little bit, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, um, just in terms of like social media and everything like that, um, I feel like it's the best and the worst thing that happened to an artist just because there's so much creativity out there and it's, it's very hard and difficult sometimes to not compare yourself to what's out there or feel like if you're not making work, oh my goodness, like maybe I should be doing this. But I think we all have our own unique journeys and our unique experiences and we get opportunities at different times. So definitely a balance and I can definitely agree <laughs> about getting a therapist or seeking one. Um, yeah, I need to go back to therapy, but or just a mentor. Or to talk to. <laughs> yeah, something. yeah, something. You know. We all need help. Um, so Carmen, thank you so much for speaking with me today. It's been such a pleasure. But I did want to conclude with a little, um, you know, get to know Carmen game. <laughs> so Ooh, okay, I wanted to know who your top three artists are, and why. Ooh. Wait, oh my gosh, that's so hard. It's okay. very hard. <laughs> okay, I'm really bad with names, so I might describe people. Um, I might be able to help you describe. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, one of my favorite artists is, I believe his name is Aaron, I want to say Douglas. He's from the Harlem Renaissance, and he was an illustrator. Eric so Douglas. A lot aha okay yes um he did a lot of like illustrations um and very dynamic you know uh I no, just love to no 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 I'm so sorry it's Emery Douglas isn't it mm. I think it's Emery Did Douglas you, is that right, his name oh was I name? right it was probably Eric Douglas now I forgot <laughs> but I please go on like it's Emery it's Emery it's Emery it's Emery Douglas. Is it? Yes. Okay. Black Maybe Panther I'm artist. I thought, his name was Aaron. I thought his name was Aaron something, but he's from, I, like I said, I'm not following my example, horrible with names, but he was a, an illustrator from the Harlem Renaissance and he did a lot of different paintings mm. and I just color and composition. Um, 
it's he had this very limited color palette but his paintings you know you just stand there and stare at them and there's just more and more layers there's just so many layers to it <gasps> wait we're talking about a different artist you're talking about aaron douglas and he yes. had, yes, I know exactly what you're talking about. Okay. <laughs> okay. We're on the same page now. It's Aaron. Yes. Sorry, everyone. It's Aaron Douglas. My bad. No, it's um, okay. <laughs> another artist I really liked um, was Kara Walker. Oh, um, yes. Really, um, I don't know what the word is, I, possibly controversial, but I just loved her her shadow pieces, you know, the black and white um, illustrations that she would have on the wall. And they were very jarring, but I just thought it was um, a really cool message to have at the time. And mm. I really liked her, con her concepts behind it. And I, also the sugar finks that she mm. did. Yes. Domino and just, you know, I just really loved her con her concepts behind the work. I felt like they were always very strong and, you know, really had a lot to say. And so Kara Walker is another. And then uh, last one I think is Alma Thomas. Um, I believe she does the very colorful, like almost, it looks like paper, but they're paintings. Mm -hmm. and, and, and it's just like color markings all through a paper, like a very large pointillism almost yeah like kind of like a mandala circular it's, just it's, kind it's of rhythm and patterns yeah exactly and uh tedious has a bad connotation but mm -hmm. I really enjoyed the like tediousness of her work um and the attention to detail and um and really just the colors I am a color person <laughs> that is why I named my company that um so yeah visually she is one of my favorite artists What's your favorite color? Oh man, don't ask me that. Okay. <laughs> um, uh, right now it's probably magenta, mm. but like a month ago, gold. So <laughs> it's a different color depending on what month or week you ask me. I would I would have said pink because you use a lot of magenta and like pinks in your work. I see a lot yes. of pink in your work. I see color, like, I see a lot of colors, but the most thing like, that stands out the most to me is like your magenta. It's really been pink lately. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, we'll see when I get out of it. <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. right now, I have a pink face. <laughs> um, okay, well, that's all we have for today. Carmen, thank you so much for speaking with, with me today. Um, my mm -hmm. other partner is on Baby Duty, but we are so grateful for you and we thank you for being on the show. Of course, the same. I'm grateful for you guys. I really enjoy your podcast and oh, I nice. look forward to hearing other ones. Oh, cool. Thank you. <laughs> so